All right, Andy, I think you could uh, make a start. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. You're very welcome uh, to this uh, session. Where uh, will power or where should power lie in a reformed health and care system? Um, I have had a few tech problems today, everybody, so I hope my, uh, my connection will, will, uh, will stand the session, but just to warn you a little bit in advance. Can I just welcome, firstly, my fellow uh, commissioners, a um, couple of uh, distinguished uh, former parliamentary uh, colleagues, uh, Stephen and, and Phil. I hope Norman is joining us, Steve. Is Norman joining? Um, probably more like three o'clock for Norman. He's got a slam meeting at, you know, the Maudsley, London Maudsley. Sure. Well, people will probably jo join as and when, but uh, thank you to all of my uh, fellow commissioners uh, for, for joining. And also we have a number of, of other attendees uh, from outside of the commission. So thanks to you all. I can see many of you on the screen. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, and we are very fortunate this afternoon to have three very uh, distinguished um, guests uh, giving uh, evidence to us uh, this afternoon. So let me just um, uh, introduce them, if I may. Firstly, Lord Victor Adeboa. Very well known to, to many of you, uh, Chair of the NHS Confederation, uh, but also Chair of Social Enterprise uh, UK, a very long um, uh, uh, record of, of delivery in the BCSE sector. So Victor is in many ways absolutely perfect uh, for the session today coming from um, of this discussion. Secondly, uh, Councillor David Fothergill. David is Chair of the LGA Community Wellbeing Board and also leader of Somerset uh, County Council. So welcome, uh, welcome, David. A week into the, the new position, but uh, uh, that, that uh, in some ways gives you that fresh, fresh perspective without having all of, all of the baggage. Uh, and then thirdly, Jackie McKinley. Uh, welcome to Jackie. Jackie's Chief Executive of the Centre for Governance uh, and uh, Scrutiny. So we will hear from each of our, our guests uh, in a moment. Um, I think it's probably right uh, that I remind everybody of the very specific questions um, that we are uh, considering as part of this session. Uh, of course, people will make broader points about um, the, the, the proposed reforms and the way we need to go post-pandemic. Uh, but there are very specific questions, and I will just go through them. Um, there has been a previous evidence session um, that uh, is available uh, to view, which also considered these questions. Um, and the aim, of course, is to influence uh, the bill announced in the Queen's speech, soon to be presented to Parliament. That's what we're trying to do today, to make some very, if we can, uh, come to a, a, a set of conclusions, compromises that perhaps can inform uh, that parliamentary debate. So just to quickly go through them. Firstly, should the proposals um, go further than is currently proposed in the white paper to ensure the proposed partnership board has a statutory duty to set the strategy within which the NHS operational board um, and local government do their work. So uh, a big question there, learning from health and wellbeing boards and the extent to which they were effective or not, um, should, the, should the relationship be more defined uh, and should the partnership board have a statutory role? Secondly, how will mechanisms for central accountability and, and inspection of the NHS connect to build on and enhance local democratic accountability? Thirdly, what specific measures should be included in the proposed new duty on the NHS to collaborate with local government and embrace uh, a health and all policies approach? I think we have a requirement of due regard at the moment, but um, what, what specific measures should be included to, to define that. Fourthly, do the rules of engagement, or at least the descriptions of best practice within the, the uh, BCSC sector need to be set out in a compact style statement uh, that, that sets out future governance arrangements and models of working. But we have sought to do that in Greater Manchester to develop a, uh, a concordat with our voluntary sector. It certainly has helped us develop that relationship further. But that's um, the, um, the, the uh, 
The fourth question, the fifth, should a system based on collaboration rather than competition uh, as its operating principle be reinforced by a stronger emphasis on transparency, accountability, regulation, independent scrutiny for how resources are used. <coughs> Lastly, what mechanisms will be in place to hold ICSs to account if they do not give sufficient regard to partnership boards or fail to engage with local, uh, local stakeholders? So <clears throat> we're here today, colleagues, to, to um, shed light we can on those um, uh, big questions, but also to see if we can um, uh, find some, some consensus. I, I draw a parallel as a former health secretary with the announcements made about the, health, the rail industry yesterday. I, I think what you have, if you have a, an approach to policy that is very top down, you, you end up with a, a silo-based approach to, to thinking that doesn't often join up on the ground. And that has certainly been the case with the rail industry uh, in our experience in Greater Manchester. And it can be the case with the health service or has been the case with the health service over, uh, over the years. I, I think what we've got to do is try and find the point of balance here between what are the, what are the, um, the, the top-down interventions from a regulatory or a... Uh, a fallback point of view if services are, are falling below a standard that, that they uh, shouldn't be allowed to go. But actually beyond the, the, the step in interventions, can we create a situation where we have a place-based approach where first and foremost, the, the vision for how services should be is primarily set by people at a local level and rather people being loyal to silos within a system. Can we create a system where the first loyalty of everybody is to the public in which they operate, in the area in which they operate, and, and move people beyond a silo-based approach uh, to working. And I think there's, there is a point of balance to be found here by creating a system that is bottom-up, I think, in its first, uh, first approach, but then has that national step-in uh, 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 situation should, should the services not be, be meeting uh, required uh, defined uh, standards. So, that's the territory in which we're going to be today, and th those are the debates that we're going to be having. You will have the ability, colleagues, to, to put in questions in the chat, so people who are uh, not commissioners. I will be going to commissioners first for questions once we've heard from our, uh, from our witnesses, but other colleagues on the call will be able to put comments in the chat, and I will monitor, monitor those and see if we can bring plenty of voices in throughout the course uh, of the afternoon. Um, and I, I would say, let's keep ourselves very focused on, on, on uh, observations that might inform the legislation. Um, and let's not dance around on eggshells as sometimes we can do at times. Let's see if we can really spell out what, what good looks like. Can we create a system that is about health promotion rather than health treatment or the restoration of health? That, that it seems to me is what the pandemic, the post pandemic world is asking us to do. Health is built in homes. Health is built in workplaces, health is built in communities, or not built in those places if we don't have uh, the right support for people. So shouldn't we be looking to build a system that is truly health in all policies, where, where places are, are fully engaged in building the health of their residents? And then how can we come up with, uh, with, with structures that, that permit that approach, uh, linking health to housing, to work, uh, to all of the other determinants of, of health that are very much in our in our minds post pandemic and obviously have been reinforced by Professor Sir Michael Marmot and his and his team. So I guess that's it from the uh, scene uh, setting uh, point of view. We have an hour and a half, Steve, don't we, to um, to, to go through this discussion uh, today. I want to hear if we can from pretty much everybody on this call. Uh, so if we all bear that in mind, keep our interv interventions focused, sharp, and to the point then we will get more out of it, all of us. And without further ado, I'm going to turn to our first guest this afternoon, uh, giving him about 10 minutes. Uh, so, Victor, Lord Victor Adebowale, the floor is, is yours. Thank you, uh, Andy, uh, for those remarks, one which I actually personally agree with, and both my organisations have lots of sympathy with. Um, let me tell you, let me talk to you about the... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm a chair of both organisations and they're both aligned actually in their views, which is really handy for me. Um, 
first of all, the Confed's position. Uh, we are generally in in favour of the white paper. You know, uh, the continuation of 2012 reforms were, were a disaster, basically. Um, our members have strongly welcomed and uh, endorsed the direction of travel that's set in the white paper, mainly because they were doing it anyway. <laughs> There's already it was it was in line with many of the things that were happening, um, and we think there is a mission to uh, to deal with health inequalities and inequity, which is uh, one of the key priorities for my members. Um, there's a lot to play out in this legislation. I spoke in the Queen's speech on many of the issues that you referred to, um, Andy, and uh, so it's worth just expressing some of the concerns that we have about the legislation because it's not all hunky dory. You know, we're not accepting it without in blind faith. Um, uh, the first of those is the concerns about the increased Secretary of State powers, um, the notion of more of uh, 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 which could undermine local democratic um, accountability. Uh, there's a lot that the Secretary of State can do without much reference or recall to rationale or reason in our view um i have said that there should be some transparency that's owned by the system and owned by the whole process as to when the secretary of state can should come in and why um as opposed to simply staying we, we all know there's no political accountability but we've also known through uh, various uh, previous attempts to uh, integrate that system change service change reconfigurations actually you know get stopped moved whatever actually we have in place a fairly good process of, of reviewing local configurations where necessary um that doesn't involve a secretary of state and the question might be well you know why why would he want to be involved to be honest um and what's the purpose of it um and the, the service reconfigurations uh, with the independent reconfiguration panel um following local authority referral seems to work quite well so why why would you change it really um we could develop it so i would change it and why would the secretary of state have any um uh, why would the secretary of state want to intervene really um similarly around appointments it's unclear what problem the secretary of state is trying to solve by wanting joint role in joint roles in key appointments um I think appointments should be done close, as close as possible to the place where they're going to have impact. I, I don't understand why the Secretary of State needs to be involved. Um, and we have concerns about these decisions becoming politicised, as we've seen. Um, and local NHS organisations already have clear processes for uh, recruiting and appointing senior leaders. Um, so there's a question about that. And of course, we have to maintain the law and principles. And of course, there's the power to abolish AL ambulance bodies virtually at will, which is equally worrying. Um, we think that the efforts to formalise partnerships working between health services and local authorities within ICF is a good thing, but we think the Department of Health and Social Security should provide greater clarity on what the statutory responsibilities of each body is within an ICS. One of the things that you know from legislation is that it's very difficult to legislate of relationships, or at least the quality of relationships. Um, you can put in place things that assess the, the outcomes and the quality of responsibilities, but you can't really legislate for relationships. Um, but I think there needs to be clearer uh, um, responsibilities. So we need to set out what the roles of the statutory, um, what the statutory responsibilities are of the bodies within the, within ICS. Um, and there needs to be much clearer, uh, 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 much clarity about our budgets are going to be allocated and accountabilities for financial flows because we know that that matters. Um, on board representation, um, the the systems need to have discretion on board representation, but um, we also need to ensure that it's not just the body of statutory partners. Um, uh, plus GP providers with no representation of the wider system because it's the wider system that's going to make the greatest difference in partnership with and to which uh, social enterprises have made it clear um, that they should be represented, um, not least because of further community services across the country provided by social enterprises. So 
it would be it wouldn't make sense uh, for them not to be and that process needs to be clear and transparent so people can see how representation happens and can hold it hold them to account on oversight and regulation of ICSs um, uh, who ICSs are ultimately accountable to is a, is a key question for our members um, and there are conversations about regulation um, I, CQC for instance uh, which are ongoing the bill should be really clear about the question of how um, system systematic failures because that's one of the biggest risks in population health systems or serious quality issues are going to be handled and CQC obviously have a role but how that happens and the transparency of it needs to be established and it's got to be clear who's holding the organizations to account as well as the system to account um, there's a complex dynamic there I think which needs to be understood on which aspects of performance um, and we support uh, the general permissive approach um, on uh, which has been adopted to date we think by NHS EI in the NHS system oversight framework which was established in um, which will in 2021 um, uh, but we wouldn't we wouldn't be that keen on 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 a regime where the CQC uses an Ofsted style rating system to evaluate the performance of ICSs, not least because they're too complex and that's too crude um, uh, an analysis. On the duty to collaborate, um, I've got three minutes left <laughs> uh, for ICS leaders. Um, uh, there's a lot of anticipation around duties to coll to collaborate, um, and and I think it's a key. Um, area for development, the wording of the bill, you know, what do we mean by collaboration um, and and what's the evidence that you are collaborating? <laughs> um, speaking personally, I only ask two questions whenever I see systems in play um, and that is how have you arrived at a, at a common understanding of the current state of population health? Show me the evidence and show me the evidence of the means by which you agree what needs to happen next and if both are simply slide packs from McKinsey, I don't believe them. Um, so there's, there's something about what evidence I'm using to ensure that you do have the basis on which people can trust each other enough to collaborate. Um, but there are some concerns about that duty impeding autonomy of foundation trusts. Um, with, uh, they have a heavy focus on resource transactions as opposed to population health outcomes, meaning, you know, we all know that money flows to acutes more than anywhere and there could be just a danger of the, the wagons changing shape and the money going to the same place so we need we need to really understand what what's what the evidence points um uh, necessary to ensure that we have collaboration in play and then on the key role of the voluntary sector community and social enterprise sector um i think there are some really strong examples and you mentioned one andy in manchester but also in west yorkshire where you have these these memorandums of understanding um, between ICSs and the voluntary sector such that uh, the VCSE has a, has a credible role in not just planning but also delivery of services because actually we're not going to reverse the inverse scale or in many places without them. Um, uh, to the extent to which we can put that on the statutory front, front footing or in guidance uh, is a moot point, but I think we need to be, be saying something more solid than we're currently saying about that. And finally, on social care, the NHS Confederation has continued to argue and will continue to argue that it's the elephant in the room here in regard to success of population health. We have to solve the social care problem. Otherwise, we're going into the population health and systems um, thinking system world hobbled basically and I don't need to go into that I mean we all that nonsense about what's well, not nonsense but we we argue about the numbers you know 12 percent cuts and uh, in um, in social care the staff vacancy rate 7.3 um, percent but fundamentally these are all examples of a failure of government to actually deal with the big issue which is reform and funding of social care and I'll stop there Thanks, Victor. Uh, that's, <clears throat> that's perfect. Uh, I've run across the issues uh, that we're, we're all uh, grappling with, but it's a lot of common ground uh, already, uh, I think, with what you said and what, what I said. 
to help this, this afternoon, I don't know whether it is helpful to think of if, if we have a concern about Secretary of State's powers or central uh, powers, maybe thinking of those more as legislating for the minimum that everyone is entitled to for the step in powers if things are not going wrong and then thinking more of the local responsibility being uh, the vision for services within that the, the improvement plan the, the prioritization i certainly feel already in greater manchester the world has changed post pandemic for instance we are going to have to reprioritize mental health within the system so you know how can that be done from a national level i think that is obviously much more easily done from a uh, a local stroke regional uh, level and i think you know, those are the kind of tensions here, here at the heart of this but you know, I, I think seeing national step in or set, legislating for the minimum is a, probably not an unhelpful way of, of starting to separate what the function of of national is compared to local and regional but thank you very much victor and of I course think that's right andy we need yeah. we need transparency and I should just say that the Confed is working very closely with our colleagues in the LGA on the bill because we think they're, they're essential partners, uh, both in the both in the legislative process, but also in the implementation. That's great to hear that. That's really encouraging. And it's obviously uh, helpfully now setting up our, our next uh, guest. Um, and so I'll hand over to uh, Councillor David Fothergill. David, over to you. Thank you, Andy, uh, and thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to appear today. Um, and uh, you mentioned earlier, so I've just been chair of the LGA uh, Community Wellbeing Board now for just over a week. Um, but I have to say, I've been leader of Somerset County Council for nearly five years. Uh, and you, many of you will remember that it was Somerset that featured on the Panorama programmes a few years ago um, with Alison Holt highlighting the issues of social care and the interface with the NHS as well. So, so I do feel that I've, I've got something that I can bring to this. And what I would like to do as well is, is as I present through the, the LGA view on each of the six questions, which are quite structured, um, I will also try to bring a Somerset perspective, because I think the Somerset rural perspective is slightly different to the Greater Manchester perspective. Um, we, are, we are a co-terminus area with our NHS. Uh, and we've got extremely close working relationships. So, so for me, there are three overriding um, issues that I, I, I hope run through what I'm going to say on each of those six, que six questions. So the first one is that, that whatever we do, we need parity of equal partnership. We need parity of esteem between those that are taking part. And it's not only the NHS and local government, but it's between different professionals, patients, communities involved. Um, and I think this will only work if there's a recognition that, that there is an equal uh, partnership uh, taking it forward. I think, I think we very much see that evolution is important and not revolution. So certainly from our perspective down here in the Southwest, we've been working at this for six, seven, eight years. It would be really wrong to throw all that out and start again because we thought we got some, some better ideas coming down centrally for us. So, so we really believe um, that evolution is, really, is important and not revolution. And then the thir third principle, which I really want to get over, is that decision making should be as local as possible. And, and I think we, we completely uh, get the, um, the national standard <laughs> for local determination. Um, we need to know what the standards are as a minimum, but then we should locally determine about how we're going to deliver those uh, and how we're going to meet the, the, the requirements of our local population. So those are the overriding three um, issues, I think. So if I just quickly run through the six questions that you've posed, because those are the ones that I think um, your, your work is structured around. And the first one was about uh, proposals to ensure the proposed partnership board statutory duties to set strategy. Well, we understand that is very much the intention of the white paper. Um, the ICS partnership will, we believe, have statutory duties to publish the health and social care and public health plan. Um, and that all local authorities with adult social care responsibilities will have the responsibility to have due regard to that plan. Uh, we do think, though, that the, the phrase have regard to is really quite vague. Um, so we do need some statutory guidance on how the ICS board and the local authorities will demonstrate that they've had regard to that plan and how uh, local authorities uh, and the IHS will be held accountable to it. I also just have to stress that local authorities, whilst health and care plans are really important, um, we can't forget that we have lots of important uh, priorities. 
Um, so we have uh, our duties in terms of looked after children, we have duties in terms of public health, we have duties in terms of education, we have various other duties. So we do need to make sure that the health and care plan uh, duties and responsibilities match with those others and that the rec there is a recognition that there is, uh, there is a, a need to work together with other departments and other functions which, which uh, are, form the, uh, the delivery of local authorities. So in terms of how the mechanism for central accountability inspection the NHS connect to and build on and enhance existing local democratic accountability, well, we are concerned about the increased powers of the Secretary of State with regard to the NHS and how this will impact on existing uh, democratic accountability. Uh, for example, the removal of the power of councils to refer NHS configurations to the Secretary of State and new powers for the Secretary of State to intervene earlier in reconfiguration. Uh, that may undermine the health scrutiny powers and the duties of local authorities. Um, that is of concern for us. And these proposals aren't, uh, aren't necessarily consistent with the general principle of resolving disputes at the most local level. They do seem to centralise that power back to the Secretary of State. Um, they must not be used to intervene or to bypass local health or joint overview and scrutiny arrangements or allow the NHS to, to refer reconfiguration proposals directly to the Secretary of State uh, just to avoid local opposition. Um, as a local authority, we are very much accountable to our public. I do sit around a lot of meetings with a lot of my colleagues. Uh, and I, I'm in very large meetings, I look around and realise that there's only one person every four year goes in front of the public to be held accountable. Um, so we do have that local accountability that we need to recognise that local um, authorities bring. Um, and we do see that the Secretary of State should only use his, his powers in exceptional circumstances, uh, but there is a definite risk of mission creep there, um, depend on how those new powers are defined and used. Um, as local authorities, we're used to the threat of inf intervention. Um, we always welcome inspection. We live within a regulatory framework. We have Ofsted and we have CQC and various other bodies as well. Um, and for us, it's about local performance, local accountability, and that they are fundamental to driving the local system. So really important to keep it local. On question three, uh, what specific measures should be included in the proposed new duty on the NHS to collaborate with local government to embrace a health and policies approach? Um, well, the LGA have long called for a shared duty of collaboration, um, but this general duty needs to have greater focus on collaboration to improve health and well-being and to address health inequalities. So many local authorities led by the health and well-being boards have adopted the health in all policies approach um, to improving health and reducing health inequalities. And we've promoted this through our improvement work and support um, the work that councils have given with their health partners. However, we do stop short of calling for new duties on all local authorities to assess the health and wellbeing impact of their policies, um, because there is an unknown financial impact on such duties. And as local authorities, we are always aware that we have to set that balanced budget. So without new duties defined with new finances, we're extremely wary about what could come our way without any financial support. Um, we're happy aware of the, the financial pressures on local government, which has been amplified during the pandemic, uh, and we therefore would not support new duties that are unfunded, costly to introduce, and may force councils to divert resources from other frontline services. Do the rules of engagement, question four, um, or at the very least descriptions of best practice with the VCSE need to be set out in compact style statement. Uh, there's no doubt to us that the voluntary and community sector has an absolutely crucial role to play in supporting people to maximise their health, wellbeing and independence. Uh, we've seen throughout the uh, pandemic how this sector has been the quickest to step in and give support to people in their need. Uh, councils have an extremely long relationship with their VCSE. Uh, we strongly support our VCSE involvement and we work very closely with them. However, we are very, we are very minded to note that all, not all councils have strong VCSEs in every area and not every area has a strong VCSE. Um, so it is really difficult to mandate um, for the involvement of VCSEs in some area where they're quite scarce uh, and quite, uh, and quite uh, superficial in that sense. Uh, equally, it's also noticeable that VCSEs do not necessarily spread across a whole um, area. They are often just uh, within pockets, within, within uh, communities or within counties or within local authorities. 
Um, so we've called on the government to ensure that ICSs develop plans and services in collaboration with their communities. Um, that includes VCSEs, which often do have a voice in the community, but we are very mindful of the fact that very few VCSEs operate at a system level. And therefore, we do have to be minded that if we're to hand millions of pounds of spend to, um, to the, the ICSs, that there is local accountability, um, particularly of how the VCSEs are involved. Should the system be based on collaboration rather than competition as its operating principle and be reinforced by stronger emphasis on transparency? Uh, absolutely, yes. Uh, of course, it should be. It's a stated aim of the white paper to increase transparency and accountability. But the accountability measures proposed are all about upwards accountability reporting to the Secretary of State and Parliament and to the DHSC rather than outwards to the communities they serve. As local authorities, we are very linked and very aligned to our communities. They determine that every four years for us. And therefore, we, we believe that it is really important that we keep existing democratic accountability to our communities accountability mechanisms within the ICSs uh, between the uh, NHS boards and health and care partnership between the, the ICS and the governing bodies such as health and wellbeing boards. And um, we believe that the government must ensure that decision making is as local as possible, that it needs to be absolutely transparent, that it needs to be accessible to local people and ultimately needs to be accountable to local people. Um, in terms of competition or collaboration, then it needs absolutely to be collaboration. We need to work together. Um, but there is also the point that local authorities do operate in a very different arena to the NHS that we just needs to be recognised. I understand that there are extremely different rules on procurement for the NHS um, to what there are for local authorities. Local, local authorities have to go through uh, competitive tendering. Therefore, um, we do need that flexibility in terms of collaboration and to ensure that we are driving things locally where everybody feels comfortable with the way that uh, it's been undertaken. Uh, what mechanisms will be in place to hold ICSs to account if they do not give sufficient regard to partnership boards or fail to engage relevant local stakeholders in their creation? Well, <laughs> I, th I think we'd say we don't know yet. Um, the CQC will be assessing ICSs and we believe the assessment criteria should include whether the ICS can demonstrate its duty to collaborate, whether it can demonstrate it has regard to the ICS partnership plan, the extent to which is supportive place-based planning, delivery and leadership. Also health overview and scrutiny committees will have an important role in holding ICSs to account. Uh, and we'd be keen to work with experts in the field, such as the Centre for Governance and Scrutiny, um, to support local overview and scrutiny committees to hold ICSs to account. So in, in, in our perspective, the NHS has been massively centralised, and they have massive centralised accountability and assessment. Local government is a very different beast. It's held, is held accountable locally, and we believe that that national accountability needs to be maintained, um, but we do need national standards, and we do need to make sure that we don't er erode that democratic accountability. That brings me to the end of my 10 minutes, hopefully. It, it does. Uh, both of you have been very disciplined, so thank you uh, very much indeed, and actually very aligned in many ways. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Is, is encouraging so thank you uh, uh david one thing that i just would pull out from what you said and just i throw it out so that we can think about it some more i take on board the uh, issues that you raise around voluntary community social enterprise sector i think what we should try and agree though is that they need to be put in a stronger place as a result of these reforms um not sort of a fringe player that's sometimes in the room sometimes not in the room i i think they are a partner and they need to be more centrally involved in 21st century health uh, and care, um, particularly on the, take the mental health issue that I mentioned before. So I think this is an opportunity to formalize that relationship as a much closer relationship uh, where they're treated as an equal partner, if you like, in the, in the business of promoting health within communities, precisely how that is done and recognizing that we may need to invest in the VCSE sector in certain places, as you say, David, where the, where the capacity isn't what it should be. Yeah. I, I think those are all questions, but I, I do think this is about changing the relationship with the sector uh, as a result of these these changes. But interested to hear what other colleagues may think about uh, think about that as we go through this afternoon. So let, let's uh, move on uh, to our third uh, guest, Jackie McKinley, who is.
who is Chief Executive of the Centre for Governance uh, and Scrutiny, who has a huge amount of expertise uh, working with local and national bodies in all of these uh, issues. Jackie, over to you. Brilliant. Thanks, Andy. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, really pleased to have the opportunity to contribute today. So as Andy said, my organisation's got had a long history, nearly 20 years now, of working with local government to promote and support democratic decision making, and that's including health scrutiny, but also a housing, voluntary and wider sector. So what I'm going to try and do today is avoid repeating, because I think we're at risk of vehemently agreeing with ourselves, which is, which is great for all of us here. We'll probably just take the opportunity to go into a bit more in depth around the questions about scrutiny and about accountability and transparency, but also what tends to work in terms of governance levers when it comes to make and change happen. Because one of the questions that you posed as the overall exam question was, you know, whether the approach to governance should be permissive or prescriptive. And I think whilst there's much to be celebrated in the white paper, as we've talked about, it really is notable as to what's not there. And I think one of the things that we haven't talked about today is that meaningful engagement with local people themselves in this. And there's a you know, really important part of that system. So I think that's something that we're keen to focus on, as well as the role and the value of local democratic governance, accountability and oversight. And our approach to these things tends to be to see governance from a cultural perspective rather than about systems compliance and process. And we know that what works is when you've got that shared vision, values, attitudes, behaviours, which lead to the constructive um, relationships that's needed. And as Victor said, and Sir Richard Lees was quoted this week, you can't legislate for a collaborative culture. You know, you need some of that freedom to exist for local leaders to, to kind of build the, the consensus that they know based on the population understanding. And we've seen great examples, as David talked about, where increased freedom and local determination have created these productive equal partnerships. However, I think we do also need to have that kind of reality check as to what we are dealing with here. We talked a little bit about the imbalance between health and social care, the difference of bringing these cultures together. A health system has been hardwired for a very long time to look nationally, particularly reinforced over the last 18 months. And also on the early stages of this massive structural and cultural transformation that it's going through. So I think that's the, the sort of system that we're trying to change. And what we do know from a governance perspective is regulation does make things happen, not perfectly by any stretch of the imagination, but gray areas where there is this lack of clarity can make things tricky to negotiate particularly for partners who might not be as big as the institution of the NHS, whether that's VCS, whether that's part of the NHS and others. So at the moment, it feels like we're not seeing all the jigsaw pieces, plenty of reassuring words around secondary legislation and statutory guidance, but whether they're enough. And I think if the white paper, as we're saying, translates into um, you know, legislation without tackling these issues, there really is that risk of drawing up, up to the national level accountability that currently sits locally. And as a, re as a result, the design delivery gets more remote away from people's needs. So kind of looking a bit more specifically on the questions around um, scrutiny and independent oversight, you know, as a little um, a little plea, you will all know this because you're all very informed, great people. You know, effective governance exists beyond the decision makers that are in the room. It needs that oversight and it needs that scrutiny. We haven't had a perfect system in local government or national government, but it has power, it has impact and it makes a difference. Brings in the different voices, brings in the independent assurance, helps avoid groupthink and, you know, helps avoid marking your own homework. And it also can bring in that national flavour, and particularly from a local democracy point of view, no one is closer to their communities. And there's a risk, I think, with the proposals at the moment that this will happen naturally, you know, that it'll happen within the NHS structures. Whereas it feels like it's something that has to be more of a conscious act and ideally form part of that formal governance framework. So when we're looking at those two bodies, it's our view that we should be stipulating what scrutiny looks like and how that will happen at the ICS level. I think whilst David mentioned there's an opportunity for local and joint health scrutiny appoint, approach, which already exists, 
there's not really that effective mandate that you'd like to see within the legislation, which will really make it happen. I think at the moment it feels like it's a bit of a secondary idea and we'll need to catch up. So we would like that to be mandated there. I think, however, we need to be clear that there are changes happening to the system. Um, I know Andy will have, probably have a view. I think we can learn lessons from the mayoral combined authority as to what's worked and not worked in relation to scrutiny there. I think we can't just keep stretching the same local government scrutiny model and expect it to work. I think there are different approaches that we can take. One idea that we've promoted over the last few years is around local public accounts committees, where you take the model that works there, it has a whole system view, provides that independent oversight of public spend impact, uh, impact on, and, and that goes beyond health. It's also drawing in other public services and the VCS as well. So that's something that we can have a look at. For scrutiny is the biggest issue of concern, as we've talked about already, relates to reconfiguration. Um, and the change in the intervention there. And I think, you know, at the moment, that's a vital long stop, which is central to local accountability of services. You know, I think if it is abolished and we get that more generalized power, it's, there's a real risk here. I think what we're seeing is, you know, words like duplication and tidying up are being used, um, which I think is, you know, not really understanding the risks that we could be presenting. And I think there's also a risk of seeing local accountability and national accountability intention here, you know, that by handing more power to the Secretary of State means we have to remove power for the local level, you know, and seeing accountability as a zero sum game, which we know it's not. So I think what we need to just look at here is, you know, the practicality of what the problem is we're trying to solve here. The reality of you know whether the secretary of state or civil servants can actually have the sort of oversight that local scrutiny um, health scrutiny currently provides from a practical perspective but also we think there is some real you know good vital insight that local scrutiny can be providing here um, as they're doing you know embedded in the local communities ensuring the plans are in place but that's something they can take a view of as to whether the ICS is working so they're taking that partnership view of whether the mandate has been filled and providing that early warning system um, which can be valuable there so being on terms of being clear on the on our asks you know, if the ambition is there to deliver and partnerships in collaboration, there has to be key components in the legislation. You know, the biggest fear we have is that things get moved to guidance. It doesn't act as a sufficient stimulus for the sort of change that's needed. And there's a high risk of it being ignored because of the other pressures on the system. We'd like to see an obligation that creates a protocol between ICS and local scrutiny functions on how they're going to work practically, you know, modes of communication engagement, but freedom to create what that model looks like, as I say, not just keep stretching the local government one. Provision as to how ICS and joint scrutiny is conducted, but also really starting to think about how that works from a local health watch linked to the health and well-being board and how those component parts will work. And then for scrutiny to have the power to formally advise the Secretary of State and for the Secretary of State to need to respond when that advice is given. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jackie. Uh, some really clear thoughts there. I think you're right to quote Sir Richard. You can't legislate, can you? This is about relationships at the end of the day. We think it's about structures or uh, uh, prescription, et cetera. It's not, is it? It's about creating an environment that allows relationships to strengthen and to uh, flourish at the local level. But actually that sometimes also requires clarity in terms of people's roles, responsibilities. So it's a it's about getting um, the minimum necessary to allow them the, the, the relationship to flourish, but by not leaving vagueness either, though, because that can be a source of conflict and tension. So that's really clear, Jackie. Thank you. So, colleagues, we've got half an hour or so now, 35 minutes for uh, your observations uh, and questions to our to our guests. Uh, so I'm turning, of course, to our commissioners. Uh, first and foremost, I've got a number of our commissioners on the on the call uh, today would want to bring you all in, certainly all of those who want to contribute. If anyone else who's not a commissioner but watching wants to put a, a question in the chat, please, please do. But I wonder if I might um, 
uh, turn to uh, to Stephen first. Uh, Stephen, I know your camera isn't working this afternoon, but um, just be keen to hear your uh, reflections on on what we've heard uh, so far, and any questions you would want to put to uh, Victor, David, or Jackie. Andy, thank you very much, and uh, apologies. Uh, you, you might you probably think it's an advantage you can't see me, but uh, I don't know why. But uh, my camera is completely packed up. Uh, I want to pick up the point you were just focused on, Andy, actually, because I think the biggest uh, concern in this legislation, um, we're all on the same square, really, about the direction of travel, but the biggest concern is precisely the point that it doesn't, it actually goes in the wrong direction on the point of clarity, uh, which you were focusing on, Andy. And it, it, the, as, all, as we all know, the, these uh, questions of who is responsible and how are decisions made, uh, the, what really matters is how di diff difficult decisions are made, when the way forward is obvious and everybody can um, sing kumbaya, that, that's all great. The, the question is what happens when, some, when, um, cho when people aren't in, uh, agreed and choices do have to be made. And there do seem to me to be two um, issues at the heart of this legislation where clarity is actually undermined rather than uh, enhanced. One is within the ICS structure itself, uh, where there is uh, the, um, the, the combination of uh, the ICS body, NHS ICS body and the ICS partnership body and uh, lack of clarity, or actually at best lack of clarity, maybe it's worse than that, uh, about where, where the ultimate responsibility really rests within the ICS and what is the role of the local authority. This is after all the devolution commission, what's the role of local voice within the ICS itself? Uh, and then there's the second question, which I've commented on briefly in the chat, prompted by something uh, Victor said, actually, about uh, if, the, if you're going to try to have co-decision between the ICS and uh, the national bodies and ultimately the Secretary of State, uh, that's all a fog. Um, I suggested in the chat that you could clarify that relatively easily, it seems to me, uh, by having a kind of cascade principle that the local bodies do decide the issue, they have the right, the, the devolved authority uh, to make decisions about the way resources are used, obviously within NHS parameters, but uh, they have the right to make decisions about how the resources are used, unless the Secretary of State explicitly and accountably, and probably with some kind of parliamentary process behind it, actually sets it aside. So the Secretary of State has a reserve power, but it's a reserve power that can only be used when the Secretary of State has crossed over a fence uh, and uh, set aside the first assumed uh, assumption in the legislation that these things sh should be, these decisions should be made uh, by uh, local structures with hopefully clarified relationships between the NHS and local authority partners within the partnership board. And I'd just be interested in um, the reaction of uh, the witnesses to that proposition. Thanks very much, Stephen. I think your first question particularly is critical. Uh, what is this precise relationship between the NHS or the ICS board and the partnership. It's currently a due regard, isn't it? But it's, if it's left as due regard in the legislation, that is a recipe for serious confusion and potential conflict, isn't it? Um, and I think it's born out of a small p political issue here about the power of the NHS versus the power of local government, who, you know, it's, I think it's, it's one that gets fudged. And I, I think it won't help anybody if it continues to be fudged. So who's brave enough to, can I just say, I hold, uh, not for the first time in my life, I wholeheartedly agree with you, Andy, on that. Mm. Sorry, Stephen. Uh, sorry, I was just wanting to agree, not coming again, just to agree with what you just said. Thanks, Stephen. 
Andy, there's a Peter. couple of people who want to speak as well. Rob and uh, and Linda, two of the commissioners have put their hands up, just to let you know. Rob Webster and Linda Patterson. Okay. What I'll do, Phil, is I'm just going to take yeah. quick responses from our guests on that very, very critical question. Then I'm going to come to Rob and to Linda. Victor, should we oh. really lay it out clearly what the power of yes. the partnership board is over the, yes. over the ICS and NHS board? Yes, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I said so. But um, wouldn't that be a tough sell to your members? Um, not really. I think a lot of our members have good relationship with local government and want to see that partnership. And where it's working, it is working because of the part. You know, it will be, be confirming what's already happening. To be honest, I think where there might be a, the struggle is the, is not so much at the level of my members, but between NHSEI and <laughs> and what happens locally. So, but but I do think that you know the fact of the matter is it would be worse for nhs ei not to have that relationship spelled out clearly you know with it, right um and it undermines the purpose i think so, on the question so don't of, fudge it is very much don't fudge it no because you're only going to create more work <laughs> and yeah. just put it bluntly um but also um at the level uh, uh stevens talks about the powers of secretary of state i agree with and in fact i said so in in my uh, in the queen's speech um response uh, which is you know the principle should be keeping power close to where it has the greatest impact <laughs> that's what you, we should be doing and the secretary of state should only be stepping in under very clear transparent you know as you say cross the fence rules where there is a failure and a significant failure um, and only after an HSEI have had an opportunity because they have a role as well so that the rules need to be clearly set out and it, the secretary of state should set should be Power should be de minimis when necessary. Right. Why would he want anything else, to be honest? Yeah. Clear. Thank you. David or Jackie? Anything to add? There, David? I'm just happy to say, say a few words on that. I mean, I think that um, the, 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 the due regard really does need statutory to, to be statutorily defined. Um, otherwise, we are in uncharted territories. Um, but the, the challenge here is to be able to, to tie things down in words, but to leave enough flexibility at a very local level to make keep things working. And I speak to my own area where things are working very well, uh, and we just need encouragement to keep that evolution. Um, but I recognise that there may be a, a need to set down a statutory level of this is what we expect from every area as a, as a, as a minimum. So, so I, 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 there is a conflict there. But I do believe that the conflict can be resolved in terms of, I think I said in my little speech there that, you know, why would you want the Secretary of State to be making all these decisions, yeah. keep decisions local, make sure, you know, local people, local accountability, local uh, understanding of the issues, um, keep it as local as possible and only refer up when you absolutely need to. But just to play devil's advocate with you, David, one second, even if that means the NHS perceives it's now taking orders from local government. Well, that's why I come back to my three asks of let's be equal partners. Let's go into this as equal partners. And I think that there needs to be that needs to be the starting point. All this. If 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 um, one thinks they're taking orders from the other, then it's not going to work. But if one believes that they're working with the other and between them, they're going to come up with the best solution, then it will work. So that equality of um, esteem, quality of partnership, I think, is a fundamental building block everywhere. Great. Thanks, David. Anything to add, Jackie, before I... I mean, I, I think, again, to agree that, you know, the, the building blocks that Stephen has described around roles, accountability, transparency, what does escalation look like? They're not exceptional, exciting things we're asking for here. They're good things that make good decision-making happen. I think, as you said, Andy, what will happen is power takes over. Where does the natural power balance lie? And then that starts to drive things. I think it would be real. What would be really interesting is what is our answer to that question? You know, as uh, Victor and David have described, there's already great kind of thinking that's going on between these two organisations. I think we've got the chance to put forward that answer rather than put, posing that as a question to the department and then wondering why they come up with a Whitehall response to it. Yeah, good. Well, let's do that. Let's agree to do that as a result of this today. Uh, Rob. I, I saw in the chat you might have to leave, so shall I come to you first um, and then go to Linda, if that's okay, Linda? Hi, Andy, I've left and come back, so I just have oh, okay. to <laughs> get something out. Um, well, so hello, everybody, my name. You go right ahead and then I'm going to turn to Linda. 
Hello, everybody. My name's Rob Webster. I lead the West Yorkshire and Harrogate Health and Care Partnership, uh, otherwise known as an ICS. Uh, so just on the uh, just on those two things then, on Secretary of State's um, powers of intervention, um, I think potentially have to save him from himself. Uh, really, you don't really want to be accountable or responsible for every little thing that goes on in every little bit of the system. Uh, but if there is going to be a power of intervention, I agree with Stephen Dorrell's proposal, and uh, it has to be fettered, really, and it has to be fettered to something. And I would say that, you know, the NHS constitution, the mandate and uh, safety are the three things it should probably be fettered to. So if you're going to intervene, it has to be because there's been a failure uh, of mandate, failure of constitution or failure on safety. Um, turning to the sort of partnership board and the ICS board, um, I'm really clear about this in my own head. Um, we've, got, we've got a partnership board of all of the partners in a place that can help improve outcomes for local people because they can help ensure people have got somewhere to live and something to do. And we also hope they'll have someone to love too, because all of those wider determinants of health are important. And when they need it, they can get good and effective health care that they can access. Um, so those partnerships in that partnership board set a strategy on that basis that will improve outcomes, reduce health inequalities and all those things. You then have a statutory body, which has a board, which is fundamentally different. But being on the board of a statutory body where accountable for money is different from being on a partnership board, which sets a strategy. So if the partnership boards are a set of strategy, the ICS statutory body has to deliver it with its partners. And it does that at different levels. So for us in West Yorkshire and Harrogate, where we've got big places and a big population, as all ICSs in the North do, most things will be delegated to a place where a health and wellbeing board has already set a health and wellbeing strategy and a place-based arrangement will spend the money and join up services. So I think what, what, what we've got to do is make sure that we understand the partnership board sets the strategy and that this statutory body, which has a board, because it has to, uh, it pays due regard to that strategy in delivering uh, and spending its money with partners to deliver the strategy. So I think it's quite straightforward, really, um, but we've got to see it in that way. And the final point I'd make is just that um, we have been at this for five years and we've got good arrangements in some places across the country. I'd say we've got pretty good arrangements. They have in Greater Manchester. David's got good arrangements. Um, we, we, we've, we, we've really got to make sure that by creating a statutory body called a system, we don't ruin the system. <laughs> because I think the behaviours, the cultures around system working are enshrined in partnership. They're not enshrined in a, stru in a structure. Um, so that's the last thing I'd say. As we were saying, Rob, structures can't get in the way of relationships or partnership. That's the, that's the, the, the trick here, isn't it? So I've got Linda Patterson, uh, then I'm going to turn to Steve Mull Mulligan. So Linda first. Yeah, th thanks, Andy. Uh, I just had two points to make. Um, one is that we're all aware there's quite a lot of noise around from pressure groups uh, around the NHS who say they really love the NHS but are very concerned about some of this legislation that's coming forward. Um, and I just wondered what our guests thought about the role of private providers in the NHS. Uh, we've talked about the um, not-for-profit sector, but I'm talking about the for-profit sector uh, of private providers or private management coming into the I ICS to help uh, run them. Um, and I think the legislation is permissive of that, but whether it's the intention or not, but I think there's a lot of noise outside of the people here, which is going on, which I certainly hear. And I just wondered what you thought of that. Um, and the second point I wanted to make was in my experience of, leg of regulation, which was quite extensive, um, the most important driver of quality is actually the quality of leadership. And that, and that includes the development of culture, 
partnership, et cetera. So it seems to me that any inspection regime of how the ICSs are running should really be concentrating not really on uh, the structures, um, but actually looking at how the leadership is engaging with people and the outcomes of that, that, that it would be perhaps a focused inspection on, but you're looking at those parameters specifically, because the rest of it will fall into place if you actually have um, strong leadership who are committed to partnership working, working with people, being open, transparent, et cetera. So that, that's my view on regulation, but I just wondered what, what our uh, colleagues thought of that. Uh, thank you, Linda. The first point you raised is, is a massive elephant in the room as well, isn't it? And, and I think it does need to be uh, to be picked up before we before we finish. But but thank you, uh, Steve. Over over to you and colleagues. If you want to come in, just please indicate in the chat. Thanks very much. I was going to take us back to an earlier point that you made, Andy, in relation to the need to build a health service which is fit for the twenty first century. In particular, bringing in the VNC sector as real partners, and in particularly recognizing the kind of mental health impacts of the pandemic and their role in helping to, to, to try and satisfy those. And I just wanted to know, firstly, I suppose, Andy, your thoughts on that, given that you raised it, because I agree with you. I, I think this is a big opportunity to try and get some of that right, but also the panel as well. And in terms of the legislation specifically, what do they think we could do within the legislation to address some of those issues? Thanks very much. Thanks, Steve. So I'm going to turn back to our panel uh, with, with those questions. Uh, I know uh, Elizabeth Stanley um, is here, a good friend from Greater Manchester, who chairs a parents group, and it very much touches on what you were saying, Linda, about outcomes for people and how does this system work for particularly uh, parents of children with special educational needs and Elizabeth chairs a group in great time that, that, that bring together parents in that position. I think it is really important that this doesn't become a structures and a, a sort of technocratic debate. These structures need to work for families who often face the greatest challenges. And I'm going to bring Elizabeth in to give her perspective uh, before we finish, because I, I think if we're not careful, we could be designing all of this from the wrong end of the telescope. And actually, we should be starting really with uh, the people who most need the system to work much better than it currently does in a much more joined up way around people and around families. And that's a really important uh, point that Elizabeth's put in the chat. But um, uh, back to Victor again. Um, obviously, some uh, I'll, I'll pick up Steve's point on the VCSE, Victor, uh, if you wanted to touch on it as well. But also about Linda's point, is there concern within the Confederation about the Trojan horse argument that this is these are vehicles for the uh, the private sector to move in American style healthcare? Um, virtually every reconfiguration of the NHS has had the same concern. Um, and I haven't, when talking to my members, I haven't heard it expressed in any great way. You know, it was a threat to their ability to operate um, at all, actually. Uh, it's not something that I've, I've heard. Um, look, I recognize that people should be concerned because are concerned about the transparency of procurement and commissioning because we're moving from uh, quite rightly from a, a position where competition was all and what we do know about competition where you've got limited resources is that it wastes them and I've seen that happen to one where there's collaboration and we're looking at processes like best value the key thing that that's that's really we must have is is clarity and transparency of the process so people can see why and who and what and to rob's point you know at the end of the day and i think it i think it it, it speaks to liz's point at the end of the day the intent the process has to match the intention that's the key test right if in, the intention must be to improve um, health population health such that you make a a, a, a recognizable difference to the inverse care law that is measurable it's measurable both in qualitative and quantitative terms and frankly if you cannot do that then whatever process you put in place is null and void i mean that it's it, it simply that it can't be any clearer than that um i think we i know the noise is off about the private sector I, frankly i think it's a distraction I, I don't think it's as i don't think that's the big issue we, that we should be 
dealing with, I think, right now. Um, I do think that the lack of clarity in the bill about the arrangements between ICSs and um, uh, local government bodies needs to be tightened up. I'm totally, totally um, on board with that. And I think the role of the BCSE sector um, and, and social enterprises, because they're so significant in the provision of health and care, needs to be tightened up. I, I, frankly, I don't think it's credible for an ICS not to have representation of, of, of social enterprises um, uh, in their mix. And we know it can be done because systems like Rob do it. Right? So, and it's the case in Manchester and they've benefited as a result. So we need to, we need to embed it in the legislation. Apologies, uh, David, sorry. <laughs> so I was going to fill in for you there, Andy, but uh, I wasn't sure whether you were going back in. Um, so I, I won't touch on the prioritisation. That's not necessarily my expertise, I'm afraid, but except to say that local authorities have been dealing with prioritisation of all different aspects for, for many years, but that, that's not relevant to this conversation. Um, the VCSE I wanted to come into, I think the VCSE really have demonstrated over the course of the last year how important they are to us, uh, the whole sector, um, you know, we couldn't have done what we've done um, throughout the pandemic without that support of so many organisations. The challenge, I think, for, for many areas, and, I, and it may well be the same in, a, in an urban area or suburban area as it is in a rural area, which is that we have a whole tapestry of um, VCSE organisations. Um, and there is, the, uh, and it's not only tapestry, it's also a patchwork of, of, of where they exist and how they come together. And I, I think the challenge for us will be, how do you help them to grow into a, um, a cohesive, much more cohesive group so that they can play a role on that ICS? And I think that's the challenge. I think that everybody has a will to involve them, um, but I can see challenges about how you, how you actually uh, get them involved and get the maximum, um, maximum contribution that they want to make. And that, that that's the point that I flag up earlier. Thanks, David. Uh, Jackie? Yeah, really, really like Steve's challenge about creating the system for the 21st century and building on what's working already. And I think that big question, which I'm sure your colleague will talk about is what sits outside of the formal VCS. So the, you know, the, the charity, the representation groups, the patient voice, the, you know, what happens when I've got a point I want to protest about? How do I engage with people in the design of service? And I think the answer to that is not a seat on the board. It's putting it through the whole system like a stick of rock. And everyone is trying to answer that question right now. You know, housing is trying to answer it, charity sector is trying to answer it, the private sector. So I think it's, you know, with the resource that sits behind the ICS, we've got this fantastic opportunity to do this in a way where we say, right, let's work out how are we going to do it? And there's things like, you know, citizens' juries and others, a whole thing around participative democracy. But I think if we just need to make sure we don't just see it as that kind of seat on the board question, because you'll only ever get a couple of people, you don't want a hundred of them in the room. But what the boards need to be doing is asking that question and challenging the whole system every time something comes to them. How can they evidence this? Where's the insight? Who have you involved? And I think that will really help us get there. So, so I can I just pick that point up, Jackie, because Steve, you asked me to comment. Um, I agree with that. I wonder whether the legislation might set out some principles for how integrated care works with voluntary and community organizations, i.e. long-term funding arrangements, not annual funding, project funding, looking to build capacity, uh, the core of these organizations, promoting local volunteering, which in itself promotes health. Um, I think it's got to set out the basis of a new relationship because I think sometimes the statutory side takes liberties um, and it shouldn't be able to really because 21st century health, I think, is going to need um, an empowered, strengthened, trusted VCSE sector. And in areas where it doesn't exist, obligations should be placed on uh, public bodies to build uh, the core capability of the, the voluntary community sector. And in that regard, I think social prescribing needs to um, move forward as a concept uh, through all of this. In my mayoral manifesto, um, I proposed the creation of a live well service 
in all boroughs. So actually social prescribing is a term I think needs to be sort of slightly left in the past and we move forward with a live well concept. David talked about the, the support that's been provided over the last year. I think we've seen the value of more informal support, everyday support, you know, without always the bureaucracy of needs assessments, et cetera, and instant support that GPs can refer to. And if that's to be structured in every community, you know, we have to look, I think, to a, a BCSE sector that's on much firmer foundations than it currently is. Uh, so I hope that makes sense. I tend to agree with Jackie. I think they have to be in the room in some way just to make sure the voice is there when big decisions are being taken. I hope I'm not glitching here. I can see a bit of freezing, but I hope, I hope they need to be some representation on partnership and on other boards. But I think it's in the principles, I think, in terms of how, uh, how we work with them is, is, is the more important side of things. I can't see any other questions in the chat. Um, I can see Phil uh, waving at me. Um, so Phil, I will bring you in, in a second. I'm just gonna to turn to Elizabeth, because I do want to kind of hear a, a true bottom up voice, if I may, in terms of what it is like um, to be parents who are working to support children who need um, uh, education, health and, and care plans, um, who often find that the site, not just the silos of the health service, but the silos of all public services are just, uh, just totally infuriating people who battle the system every day. So what will this change mean for parents like Elizabeth? So, well, Elizabeth, you're a better place to talk about that than me. So I'm going to hand over to you. Hi, um, can you hear me okay? Because I've got my airpods in. Um, you, you may also uh, hear children running up and down the stairs because the Tesco's delivery man arrived and left about 30 seconds ago. Um, so life as a parent carer is uh, ridiculously difficult and unnecessarily so. There's so much batting around between the NHS and social care and local authorities, it sometimes beggars belief. And many parent carers are just absolutely exhausted by it. Um, the discussions that we have in our small group of families and parents are very much around what differences an ICS system and structure going to make to people. So we're very keen on the fact that the thing that we talked about yesterday in terms of the citizens panel is that say for example you're talking about social care for children or adults that there may well be a panel of people who at whatever age who access and get support from social care but that their role is to dig behind the facts the figures and tell the stories of the people receiving that social care where is it working well and where is it not working well and what can be improved and we always go back to the so what question you can change as many structures and systems as you like but what difference does it make to people and unless you actually go out and ask people how is it affecting and impacting your life you don't actually know um, and that's something that is a theme that's run through all of our all of our weekly meetings that we've been having for a good few months now um, so I'm a big plea to everybody on here. I don't know what your roles are or your jobs. You've probably all got massive long titles. Um, but as a, as, a, as a mom and, and a parent carer, you know, please make this work because we, we, we really need it to. You put that really well, Elizabeth. Thank you. For, yeah, a few rounds of applause as well. Steve, that should be a sort of prior question to your six questions in some ways, because they are all quite structural, aren't they? What difference is this going to make for people? Particularly people, families, who often face the greatest challenge in, in working with the system. That, I think, is, is, is obviously a, a, you know, is the, the, the question in many ways. So, Victor, yeah. you're, you're well placed to, uh, to take that yeah. one on. No, I can... I can tell you the fundamental difference, that, uh, use the technical term, the fundamental difference it should make is it, it should create positive value transfer. In other words, you should, you should not be pushed from pillar to post and post to pillar in the search for health and care for two reasons. One, it costs you time and money. And two, it costs the system time and money. But to put in more, um, uh, look, if you're a, if you're a, a woman who's, who's fallen, um, uh, she has a fall, 
uh, you, somebody calls uh, the ambulance, the ambulance comes, you've got multiple comorbidities. The hospital um, is aware of that, but can't discharge you. And you're in the hospital longer than you need to be. So you get iller, but then the hospital needs the bed. So you get discharged, you go back home, you fall again. <laughs> you see, that's, that is a repeated process of what happens at the moment. What should happen is you fall, the, the fall nurse comes, she calls the um, the ambulance. The ambulance comes. She's maybe a couple of hours in the, in the hospital, check you out, make sure that your carer or relative is available when you get home. And the fall nurse is there to provide you with a care plan, increase the visits and ensure that you are kept safe where you are. That, that's the difference that population health should make. Furthermore, it should be able to predict that you're going to fall in the first place and buy you a pair of slippers because that's one of the main reasons why the elderly fall in the first place. And I'd refer to rather frustratingly something that I did when I was the chief exec, I'm a recovering chief exec now, but when I was chief exec at Turning Point, we designed something called Connected Care, which did this at scale. And, you know, if population health means anything, it means that people like you, um, Elizabeth, um, are confident in the fact that the health system comes to you rather than the other way around, because thanks what I and you pay for. How can we build that principle in, Victor? Because obviously, breaking down the silos, as I said, making sure that people have their first loyalty to Elizabeth and the other family she works with, rather than to their own organisation or their own well, bit of the system. I, I, how, how do we change I, that? Well, there's, there's two ways it can be changed. And, and I have to say, um, this, these are the weak spots um, in the whole process. And you've said it, you know, if we get bogged down in the structures we've done but somebody I think it was Linda talked about leadership and ultimately this is going to be about really clear local leadership that understands what system leadership is and where it's working that's what happens so I mean I hate to big you up Rob but where you understand you get system leadership and what system leadership means is that you you are leading beyond the boundaries of your organization in the interest of the population which means that when you plan you are planning with the people who are paying for the service. And, and when that plan is produced, you're putting it in the middle of the table and you're saying to the trusts, the, uh, the various trusts, the voluntary sector, etc., what is your contribution to making this plan real and delivering the intention within the plan? And that forces them to answer one question. Are you, are you leading this plan? In other words, it's the de delivery of it. Are you following it? In which case you're adding value or do you need to get out of the way so that actually the plan can be delivered now that is that is system leadership in a nutshell and what it means is that actually your contribution to population health is not the same as you thinking how do i protect my budget for which there's too much of there's too much of that thinking in the in the nhs and social care system at the moment so i'm just going to throw something in then just to to, to um you know come back on it. So i agree with everything you've said but the question is how do we make it real do we need to think of a rights-based situation here for us? I think Elizabeth? if you have population Elizabeth health, by different, yeah, people like if you have population. I think, well, to be yes, I mean, in a sense, look, people already have a right; they're paying for the service, right? So it's not. So I think it's built into the to the relationship that lead the leaders of health and social care systems, by which I mean local government and health systems, have to their populations their patient citizens. I think that statement of um, your rights to an appropriate health and social care system that meets the needs of you and your family need to be built into the commissioning process. And the commissioning process should be poorly defined at the moment, in my view, and it needs to be defined as the, need, the means by which you understand and certificate that you stand the needs of an individual and or a community such that you can build a platform for procurement. Just making that distinction alone drives commissioning into a place where it is accountable and it has to show how it's understood the needs of individuals and or communities across a population health system before they can spend a penny. Excuse the language, I, you, I don't mean spend a penny, I mean spend a pound of, of our taxpayer, taxpayers' money. And that is perfectly doable. It is being done as we speak. It just needs to be repeated. Thanks, Victor. David, I saw you waving. Yeah, I, I just wanted to come in because I think we, 
what's happened over a number of years is that silos have been built, but I, I think we need to recognize that in a lot of areas, those have been broken down and continue to be broken down. I mean, we, we embed social workers into our main hospitals to get people out as fast as possible. Uh, we get, get them home first. That is our priority. Um, so picking up uh, Victor's point. Um, but what, what I hope that this legislation will do is will create a, a, a more of a... Um, more of a vehicle to try to get that going in more areas so we can create that model and that aspiration. But, but we've just got to be careful we don't hold back the areas that are already flying by legislating and then holding them back. So there is this danger that we need to, we need to bring everybody up to, to that standard. But at the same time, we do need people to keep showing that leadership in the areas that they're already showing it. Absolutely. I, I think I'm going to turn to Phil, uh, I hope in a second, just to start to bring us to, to a close and sort of pick up the points of consensus, Phil, that you've, you've heard this afternoon. But I think Elizabeth's challenge is the right one, though, in that it is still those adults with learning disabilities, the, the, uh, the Winterbourne View scenario, which obviously we know uh, persists. It's children with special educational needs who are still with their parents going to tribunals trying to get support. Um, I, I think we do have to acknowledge here that the current structures and the way that they work do pass people from pillar to post and often don't give those with the greatest needs the first and best support, which is what they should do. And um, I just think that is a, a sort of first order question that, that, that why will this make things better for people um, before we get into any uh, the power, power battles of, of the NHS and local government world is, is, is many ways the question. Um, conscious of time, colleagues, I'm not seeing anyone else. Oh, um, Sorry, uh, I'm missing people here, aren't I? I don't know whether I was slow in my... Uh, uh, I'm going to probably have to take quick contributions, uh, colleagues. So I had uh, Joe, um, Joe Pritchard wanted to come in. Peter Hay as well. Yeah. Shall I come in very quickly then? Um, Please, my, point, my point really is um, around the fact that so much of this bill um, feels it's written for the NHS and purely for the NHS, and yet the NHS historically has been very poor at engaging with the BCSE sector, um, except when it was required and helpful. Um, and therefore, there is a real opportunity to reset, as many people have been talking about. There are two points to this, though. One is that BCSE is a great lumped sort of um, set of initials, and yet obviously it comprises this huge range of different organisations, some of which are huge, um, over £100 million turnover community providers who we believe at SUK should be part of ICS boards as they should be part of that parity of esteem in terms of looking at that collection. And then we have that great group who are part of the infrastructure, many of whom are not known to people. And for us, um, it's about how do you engage them effectively and how do you invest? And that's not just one government department, that's a cross government issue around how do we support and enable the VCSE sector. And one approach is to use the existing large-scale social enterprises to bring those organisations together. The other is to use the Concordat form. And I think that should be done locally, but making it a requirement that there is a mechanism in place and also that there is the investment to support and to grow the sector. Otherwise, we're not going to hear fully the voice of local people, which the VCSE sector is best placed to deliver. A lot of sympathy with that. Thanks very much, uh, Joe. Peter, Peter Hay. Thanks, Andy. Uh, first point just builds, I think, on where you were, Andy. Um, I'd like to see us, I think, perhaps build in some challenging stretches for the groups that we know. Uh, voice gets rarely heard and expressed in life. So parents of children with special education needs, you said, the Winterbourne View Group, which has been unchanged for a decade, end of life. The points of, of where we know that integration has, has yet to show real benefit and we know where people are too knackered to be able to express voice, basically. And secondly, just a, a sort of slight provo provoca provocation back, really. Um, I'd like the engagement with the VCSE to be as challenging delivery partners. Um, and I mean, not just delivery. Um, you should be engaging with the VCSE because actually their purpose is challenging. Um, I sit across Anchor Hanover and Turning Point, that's 650 million pounds worth. Um, we're not just a delivery agent. We are there to change lives and to be challenging, uh, whether that's about things like do not resuscitate orders last year, about the challenge I've set Victor's successor in turning points, 
that every service we deliver would be purchased back if we gave everyone a direct but an individual budget um, or about the work we're doing in Anchor Hanover to stop looking at performance downwards and inwards and to think from the person outwards and upwards because they're so old and so frail that it's got to be immediate and responsive um, at an individual level and I just think there's something about bringing that rub to the table that is really important and needs to be valued, treasured uh, and accepted. Great contribution. Oh, I'm frozen there. Great contribution, that Peter. Really clear. Uh, completely agree. Uh, Dick, I can see you putting a point in the chat. Would you like to make it before we finish? Uh, just that, that as, as well as the systems that will empower people and empower carers and people like, like Elizabeth, it's important to shift the power. And so in, in the chat, I'm just suggesting actually we could build that in. So what partnership boards are meant to do? that they should actually have explicit systems that will build citizen and carer influence. Of course, that's likely to be things like citizens, juries and panels and so on, but they've got to have a plan that, that they'll have to be accountable for and people can test its quality at the start. That, that would then help bring information to change debates as, as we go, go forward and, and push towards population care, which of course has to cut across different silos and institutions. So that, that's the point. It could be Brilliant. a simple clause in the bill. It certainly could. I think we've got to some very profound questions towards the end of this session, actually. Um, but before we finish, I'm going to just ask Victor, Jackie or David whether there's anything you wanted to say before I turn to Phil, just to, to give us a, a final couple of thoughts. The only thing I'd say is that um, there's a sense that this is... And this is a very important bill. Um, it's not the same as uh, the 2012 Act because we've already got the formulation of some of it already going. Um, but I, 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 I think there's a saloon that the NHS has just walked into post post pandemic. Uh, we have to get this right. In that sense, the population health there isn't a Plan B. You know, we have to get it right. This cannot be just a case of rhetoric and the same behaviours. We're going to have to change behaviours. Um, and that's what the CONFED um, is really focused on, uh, getting that quality of leadership and keeping the likes, uh, keeping Elizabeth in mind as we encourage our members to, to, to do better um, and to deliver population health, which is what they want to do by and large. Thanks very much, Victor. David, any final thoughts? I, d I just wanted to go back to my three overriders, if I could, and just say, we just need to bear in mind that we need to go into this as equal partners, uh, all of us. It's not just local authorities, and it's not just uh, the NHS, it is the VCSE. We should be viewed as equal. Um, and that, that it has to be evolution, not revolution. And then finally, we just have to keep it local. So much is working locally. Let's make it work everywhere locally. Um, don't let's lose it um, by throwing it out with the bathwater. Yeah, thanks, David. Laura Choke put a good point in the chat about the levels of coordination vary. You know, where there's mayoral combined authorities, it might be higher, and where then not everywhere, but in other areas, it might. So just understanding how local is made to work better yeah. everywhere, and I think there's a a read across to the levelling up white paper, I would say here, um, that you need to think about the bill alongside the levelling up white paper and the strengthening of local government structures everywhere, because you know, we are very much in favour of everywhere getting what Greater Manchester has got. We believe it's working. I would, I would modestly say that Greater Manchester public gave an indication that it's working at the recent election, um, and we want everywhere to have, uh, have a degree of that or the same. So... You know, think, think of the levelling up white paper, everybody, as part of this as well. And what submission, Steve or Phil, this group might make to the levelling up white paper to strengthen the wider structures in local government and devolution to support the ICS model. Uh, Jackie, is, is there anything final for you before I turn to Phil? We're, we're running up right against the clock now, but uh, keen to... 
Yeah, a, a very brief point. I think success would be in our submission back in relation to the white paper is if we can encapsulate some of these points about mindset, leadership, citizen voice. I think the idea of uh, Dick's idea of the kind of principles that we could put in the legislation, but that's the element. If we can achieve that, then we can just shift that conversation away from being seats on boards and structures, which I'm not sure has been achieved in legislation before. So we can set ourselves a good challenge there. Great. Well, thank you to all of you, our guests. You've been brilliant this afternoon. I have lots of comments in the chat saying how clear your presentations have been. Phil, I'm going to pitch it to you. I think at the end, as I was saying, we did get to some fundamentals that maybe were a bit missing in our six questions. What difference will this mean for people, particularly people at those critical moments in their life, as Peter was saying, you know, uh, people who are most dependent on multiple services. Um, I think more needs to be done there, maybe a bit more of a rights focus for, for people in, in terms of how they interact with this new integrated system. But Phil, over to you really for final. Yeah, no, that, that's great. And I, I, that was very helpful. Uh, I, um, and I agree with you, Andy. I mean, that the first session that the, uh, the commission held also touched on this issue about, well, why? We have all these structures and boards and wiring and systems and all that, but for what purpose? And being very clear about that and how that is reflected in the way that the boards operate is really important. So um, that's added, this last bit of the conversation today is really added to that thinking. So it will certainly be reflected in what we write. And I was just reflecting as a former minister for the third sector back in the day, uh, when we wrote a third sector strategy and we had the ideas of compacts and concordats and of working together. Um, in a way, I think the NHS may have escaped that first time round, even though that was 10 years ago. Um, maybe now we can make sure that we have a, a, a the, this is the opportunity to really bring all of that thinking back into the fore uh, because of the importance of the voluntary sector and the community sector and social enterprises to improving population health. Um, one area we didn't discuss today, which we haven't got time for now because we're ending, is the role of the large acutes in the system, something we've talked about in the past. That's another one of my elephants in the room. How, do the, how are they accountable and how do we make sure that all the resources and money and so on don't flow to them? because we're trying to get things out into the community and helping with prevention. So we're going to try and cover that in the report that we write, Andy, to, to uh, put to, uh, to government. Um, and the idea of diversity in the room, I think it was something that somebody said in the chat, um, you get much better transparency when there's lots of people in the room watching what you're doing uh, and finding the, how that happens from top to bottom, I think, is one of the, the keys to maybe this challenge of uh, ensuring accountability. Um, so the terms of the process there, and I want to say thank you to everybody. If anybody on the call or has been uh, taking part would like to submit written evidence or a written comment or a note, uh, we would really appreciate that. That'd be really helpful because that all then adds to the, the weight of the report uh, to back up the kind of uh, the conversations that we've had uh, today. So please do that. If you've got a particular thing you either want to re repeat as it were in writing or didn't get the chance to say, but want to say it, please just email uh, us at Devo Connect. Um, what will happen now is we will write a, a consensus a report from the first both hearings and you and as co-chair with Norman Lamb will be then uh, uh, sort of signing that off just so that everybody understands uh, the process. Um, we then want to have a parliamentary hearing with MPs before the second reading. Uh, so we expect the second reading of the bill to be sometime in early June, maybe June the 13th perhaps, we're not sure, we'll We'll know that in more detail, um, but before that, we would like uh, to be able to um, to talk to the MPs, perhaps yourself, Andy and Norman, um, and commissioners uh, in the room to, to sort of put across to those MPs the, the huge consensus there is, cross-party consensus, as well as cross-sector consensus about the agenda that we've just been, been talking about today. So that'll be the process following this. Over to you, Andy. Thank Great. you very much. That's really clear. Yeah. Thanks, Great. Phil. That's, that's really clear. To be honest, everybody, that's been a great conversation. There's been more consensus on this call than I thought there would be, actually. And um, it's a little bit like transport policy. It's been a quite a divisive place for, what, 25 years, to be honest. And I think the moves the government made yesterday are much more towards a more consensus position that people can support. And it feels like the same is happening with health and care policy at the moment, let's, let's hope so. Certainly this call, I think we could find a consensus amongst ourselves. The bit that's never worked, and we've not really touched on Phil, is public involvement. Community health councils, PPI, and it's had Health Watch, it's had a million 
iterations. I think if the partnership board has got right, that's the public involvement, isn't it? Because you have elected representatives like David, like myself, held to account by the public. And then you make public participation meaningful alongside other community representatives. And I think something about this structure truly nailing public accountability in a way that the health service has never, ever been able to get right through its various forms. And that's just something that needs to be thought about in your, in your write-up, I think, which we haven't really had a great deal of time to, to pick up. But I would st stress to you this relationship with the VCSE, formalising it, equal partners, strengthening it. And also, I would encourage a consideration of a rights-based approach for the public as well. This system's in the end got to be accountable to Elizabeth and all the parents groups she represents, much more so than it currently is, and, and all public bodies within this integrated system. So thoughts that come out towards the end, but thank you everybody. Um, I think we can go away feeling we've had a, a, a good hour and a half, job well done. Um, if, yes. if some of this, hopefully more, quite a lot of this can be reflected in the legislation. I think we'll be all, certainly on the path towards a, a proper 21st century uh, health and care system, health promotion system. So thank you. Thank you for your time, everybody. Thank you, Steve, and all of your colleagues for convening it, and to my fellow commissioners. And we will look forward to see what comes from it. Okay, thanks all. Thanks, Andy. Cheers. Thanks. Bye. Bye, man. Bye.